Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bella Naiman. I am the co-founder of New York City Jewelry Week. Uh, in, the, in case that this is your first time joining us, uh, New York City Jewelry Week is dedicated to promoting and celebrating the world of jewelry through educational and innovative uh, focused programming like the one that we have here for you today. Um, our ongoing web series, Jewelry Confidants, allows you to eavesdrop with permission on conversations between some of the most brilliant minds within the jewelry world. Today, I'm so excited to welcome you to Truth and Desire, From Pearls to Friendship with Melanie Grand and Melanie Georgiacopoulos. Melanie Grant has been a journalist for over 20 years, having worked at The Times, The Financial Times, The Independent, The Guardian, the BBC, and now The Economist, where she writes, edits, styles, and art directs luxury content for 1843 Magazine, the lifestyle sister publication. Her specialist subject is jewelry as art and commodity, and in October of 2020, this culminated in her first book, Coveted. Mel's confidant today is Melanie Georgiacopoulos, who began her exploration of the pearl during her master's degree at the RCA in 2007, before establishing her eponymous label in 2010, which is centered around exploring and redefining contemporary pearl jewelry. In 2013, she started collaborating with Tasaki, and together they founded the directorial line MG Tasaki, which marries Melanie's flair to cross design boundaries with the Japanese, Japanese jewelry company's world-renowned craftsmanship. She was appointed head designer for MG Tasaki in 2015 and has been a visiting lecturer at Central St. Martin's for the last five years, whilst she continues to create her own collections and one-off pieces for special projects and private clients. So before I hand over this conversation to Mel and Melanie, we will start off in the way that we start all of our jewelry confidants chats, and that is, how did you two meet? Well, <laughs> how did we meet? So I, th I think we met for the first time. Okay, so we met properly in 2018, we think, exactly. um, in London, because Melanie had uh, was showing sort of like a trunk show, had a collection. And I, I um, Liana, who is very famous in the jewelry world as a quite a character, phoned me up and said, you've got to come. And I said, oh, I'm so busy, but you know, I, I went. And we just kind of clicked. We, we're both very forceful over the top, slightly, uh, we're kind of both forces of nature in our own way. And um, we got into quite a heavy duty conversation about jewelry and life and, pearls and I think I was there for about three hours uh, you know, the, the person next was waiting outside and it was very yeah. hot and I just remember thinking this is a woman I'm going to know I'm going to come back to and actually oh. have a good friendship with oh. and ever since I think we meet up maybe once twice a year and we it's like a conversation that keeps going every time it gets a bit deeper and more interesting usually involving uh, dinners and, and drinks and I think it's it's, we've talked about a lot of things that we're going to talk about tonight, but I think perhaps not in such a condensed way and also such a, a structured way. So I'm really looking forward to our chat tonight. So shall I start or do you want to start? <laughs> I was to say, well, then you, you take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, my approach tonight um, was to really talk with Mel about collecting because I know from previous conversations that she actually collects jewelry. And I'm not particularly interested in uh, asking her what jewelry she collects, but I want to know her point of view as a collector, because as a jeweler, a collector is something usually quite far remote that you dream about that one day you're gonna encounter. And finally, I have one in front of me who actually likes to give her opinion and likes to share things, which is not always the case. So I want to, sort of take the approach of discussing with her what makes her collect and um, sort of how a collector thinks, although it's very hard to, of course, uh, give a very, like it's not, there's not one character of a collector, but I wanna explore that through our conversation tonight. So I would start maybe by asking you, why do you collect jewelry? And maybe not, not, not other things, or unless you collect other things, but what makes you collect specifically jewelry? Well, I think most collectors collect lots of things. They just, they just collect. So 
I collected stamps when I was a kid, I collected comic books. I even collected, you remember when there was, when, when we ate, actually ate bread uh, before the Atkins and um, they were those kind of plastic kind of um, toggles. Like I, I had about 10,000 of them. My mum used to say to me like, what are all these plastic things you've got in drawers? So I was always like finding things and collecting them. And I think I got to a stage where I discovered jewelry and it just sparked, you know, I, I just went up a level. And um, when I was writing the book, I was talking to various collectors about high level collecting of jewelry. And what I think emerged were, there were two paths in from what I could tell. Um, so when you're a designer, you know, at the beginning, you have to kind of make a choice. Sometimes you don't make it consciously or it's made for you, but essentially you've got to either choose to go into the collector's art market with your work or go into the investor's index of kind of intrinsic value. Um, if, you, if you're more commercial, you go in, to a place where you're selling much more on the value of your materials. And if you're, more, if you're deciding to go for the art market, it's a lot more about you as a creator and your intention. And so I do think that collectors collect for life. It's a lifetime investment of time, commitment, interest, money. Um, and I, I think it's interesting that often when designers have to make that decision, they're under a lot of pressure financially. And sometimes it's not a decision um, that they're aware they're making. And I see a lot of collectors ask me and designers, you know, about that phenomenon. Mm. Do you wear the jewelry that you collect? Yeah, I have things I've never worn, mm. you know. I have things which I just look at. Mm. I don't have to wear it. Mm. I wear it because I have to have it in my life because mm. when I see it, I can't leave it. I can't walk away, my chest hurts. I don't care how much it costs, you know, you get to a point, you know, you know, it's going to hurt. And, um, you know, designers often, they can see that moment in you. And, you know, when I bought my first substantial thing, the designer mm -hmm. said to me, like, just pay me in installments. And it took me three years to pay it off. Mm -hmm. I couldn't leave that room unless I took it with me. So do you know, I mean, does it, do you have sometimes um, a period of time that passes and you're still thinking about it and yes. then you say, okay, I'm going to sort of jump in and hurt? So as you uh, get older and you've got more stuff yeah. and you don't need as much, and when you're in this industry and you're around it all the time, you don't have to buy as much. So what tends to happen is I say to myself, right, walk away. Mm -hmm. And then if I still want it in two or three weeks time, if I'm still dreaming about it and thinking about it and like aching for it, Mm -hmm. then go back but usually it's like falling in love you know right from the second you see it if you want yeah. it or not yeah and how much are you influenced by the person who makes the piece I mean how much are you allowing yourself to consider you know this is a brand that's been going on for 100 years so they're likely to carry on for 100 years or this is a young designer he might you know stop making things next year is that does it come into play or do you sort of shut that out yeah i mean i don't really collect branded jewelry you know there's a lot of people who will say right i want a van cleef and i want this and i want that you know i think it's a different sort of mode of collecting really mm -hmm. um, i tend to collect people who i think are interesting I want to be part of their universe. I want to be a part of their soul. I want to take that piece of soul away with me and to cherish it and to be, be part of them. So that is much more, if there, if there is a brand, it's a designer that I'm quite intensely kind of interested in. You know, some brands like say Boucheron, for example, Claire Schwozny is a fantastic designer. I'd love to own something of hers. I don't care if she's at Boucheron or not, it's just her. Mm -hmm. And she happens to be there. So. I think you do connect with certain designers and they just where they are. So if someone, for example, if you loved a piece, you saw it, but you'd never met the maker yeah. or designer and it, it turns out to be someone not particularly nice, does it put you off? Well, now it's better because as you get further into collecting, we're talking about the phases of collecting. Mm -hmm. As you get further in, you want something which is surprising and unknown and only you know about it. And that gives you a perverse thrill. And it's something that you work up to throughout many years of collecting to get to that stage. Mm. Yeah, so talk to me a bit about, because I know we've talked about this before, how you said to me before that you feel 
um, the, the, the sort of the mindset of a collector is evolving throughout their life. And you had presented that to me quite clearly last time. <laughs> and you seem to have evolved. And I think you already yeah. seem to anticipate how you're going to potentially evolve next, looking for perhaps at other collectors. So talk to me a little bit about this sort of transformation. Well, sometimes you grow into things. And we were saying, like, uh, I interviewed Hemele for my book, and they said to me, we often... We want people to come back so we don't try and sell things to people who you know won't love them as much as we love them we, we give something to somebody who in 10 years time will suddenly think that is that's the thing and I, I understand that totally because I have bought things from people at the time I trust the designer but I'm like I'm not sure about these earrings like I never wear this kind of thing it's a bit dangly I don't like these stones and then 10 years later, they're the best earrings you've ever seen and you wear them every day, but you weren't ready for them at the time. Mm. And often designers can see where you're going and they will give you something that you grow into. You don't yeah. get tired of it. It doesn't get left in the drawer. It, be it becomes you. So yeah. I think you've got to trust the person you're, you're investing that time and effort into mm -hmm. to give you. That's why I always say to the designer, give me what you think I should have. Like, as much as I might want this, I want you to tell me, like, I like this kind of thing, but you create something and just give it to me. So you're not one of those people that wants to intervene to say, oh, you know, I like the sapphires you put there, but actually my favorite stone is emeralds. Can you make that? Can you change the stones for me? I want to, but with everything I've learned, I stop myself. Ah. Everyone wants to. Everyone who, you know, is, I suppose, gets to a stage where they've got any kind of taste or any kind of collection, thinks they know something, mm -hmm. we really don't. <laughs> so that's the key, understand that. But how about this idea that if you get something customized for you, then it's totally unique? Because still, it doesn't matter if it's a unique piece in the first place? The designer, you know, it's still customized or not. The designer has to interpret, like, who you are, who they are, you know, you, you, you can't, you're, I'm not the designer and I have to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I can go and make my own piece. Mm -hmm. It's easy enough. You can go and find a, a goldsmith and sure. no, I'm coming to you because I want you. And I don't want me telling you, I want you to tell me. But you expect a unique piece? Yeah, I like something that no one else has. I mean, who doesn't as a collector? Mm. Yeah. So you said to me, now you're in a stage where you'd like to wear something that very few people might recognize. Yes. Do you already think of what the next stage is from looking at other collectors? Is there a next stage of, of collecting? Yeah, you want something, I think, it's a bit like, you know, if you're collecting, say, painting, mm -hmm. you kind of want something that no one knows about, you probably never tell anyone about, which is just, there's a fantastic film um, that I made a friend of mine watch recently. Well, there's this art dealer and he basically has a room in his house filled with masterpieces that no one ever sees or goes into. He goes in there every night and sits there for an hour and just basks in the glory of his life's work, which is collecting. Wow. And, you know, I get that. I think in a sense you should share it with other people, which is what we wear it to do that. But I get having that pure, undiluted kind of moment where you, the, all the things that, express all the areas of your life you're just there you just and you see your life before your eyes you see who you were at that moment when you bought that thing true 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 i feel i should ask you a question now melanie because i feel technically I'm this is your, well, i can't be done <laughs> uh, last one um oh. do you ever think of what happens with your collection after you, you because i didn't have any kids so i'm hoping I'll get really old and really hot kind of like nurses who like, like Elizabeth Taylor, who had a succession of very young, very hot male nurses will come and look after me just so that I can give them my collection later on. So that's what I'm hoping for. Oh, but she gave it to Christie's in the end. I mean, it was auctioned. She did. But, you know, obviously there's, there's always that possibility that you can hand something off to somebody, you know, who might be nice. So to put your you don't with. want this to stay as one body of it's items. Not, it's not that significant. You know, I mean, I think you're talking about serious collections where you're, you, you give them to museums. I'm not sure museum would want my collection of bits and pieces, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, hopefully I would love it to, to be worn by people who I, you know, who I really love and admire. So 
I think I personally think it's a travesty if you if you buy things um, and you never wear them. I mean, I've got things I haven't worn partly because they're too big or they're a bit crazy, and I thought, what was I thinking? But I think um, I do think you should wear wear what you buy because I think that I think the designer deserves that. You know, you spent ten years on the piece; it needs to be out there. Mm. Okay, your turn. I'm going to make a pause now. So I'm going to ask you, Desire, when you're creating your work, yeah. are you aware of creating Desire? Um, or is it something that just happens naturally and you don't really care about it? Um, I think it has probably evolved what I'm thinking about while I'm making work and when I'm, while I'm thinking of future projects. I think the last few years, as my confidence is growing for a huge number of reasons, I allow myself to be more free. And I think if I desire the piece, then someone else might desire it. But my uh, my primary, um, not concern, but my thought process doesn't involve, oh, I have to sell this. And it's funny because I was thinking about this the other day and because of teaching at Central St. Martins, a lot of times I probably said it myself too, when you teach um, students, you say, don't make it to sell it because it's going to show and you won't sell it. And I think I've said it a lot of times, but I'm, I probably didn't spend too much time thinking about it for my own pieces. But it's true because the moment something happens, the moment you're like, OK, I'm going to put something there bigger or, you know, more gold or this or that it just spoils the the energy as you say the soul of the piece and i i'm starting to allow myself to just create what needs to be created the way i'm thinking about it in my mind and if that means that i'm going to make one piece a year because it has to come out that way and it's going to cost a certain amount of money then i'm okay with that but i think that the mindset has changed and it's um you know because i'm growing as a as a woman as i'm 40 year old years old now my collaboration with asaki is ongoing all sorts of reasons that give me the confidence to just relax about it because i think at the end of the day i think if i create something that i'm happy with and i've said okay i've given as much as i can now then if it doesn't work, then I can only blame myself. But if I start putting all these components of, oh, you had someone told me I should do it like this, or some, someone told me, you know, that's the price point you need to hit to attract collectors, which I've heard all sorts of advice over time, it's just not going to be me. It's going to be bits of other people and little voices. And I think that's eventually going to show. I mean, I can still look back at certain pieces and see that I didn't push enough. But at the time that I made them, that was the best I could do. And actually, maybe that's what it is. You know, you can never look back in retrospect at your work because you're a different person in that moment. You were somebody else. Yeah, but it's funny how sometimes I can also see that some of the work is autobiographical. So when I look back, I can see, especially with some Tosaki collections when I was pregnant, for example, and you can, I can see that in the piece, it doesn't matter if anyone else sees it, but I, it brings a smile to my face because I felt then it's, it was an honest representation of myself mm. at that time. So I can make certain links to certain pieces. And I think that's the best that I can achieve at any, any given time of my career. <laughs> I like that career. Yes. Um, and so money, I'm going to talk about money because in Britain, we have a problem with money, talking about it, you know, oh. talking about it, like discussing it. Um, we were saying earlier that getting into the industry, often people stumble into it by chance, unless you're part of a sort of dynasty of, of jewellery designers. Mm. Um, and a lot of people end up, I, over the years at The Economist, people have come to see me who have been investment bankers and have decided to leave and they become jewellery designers. Yeah. They're from very wealthy backgrounds and they have very wealthy partners who support them. Would you say it's, if you come from money, is it easier or is it harder? Um, and do you think it's kind of, how does that affect us in the industry in terms of people coming into the industry who are designers? 
Um, after 10 years of existence as a brand, I would say it's probably harder to enter with money uh, because even myself, I've been in contact with people with a lot of money who started a business and everyone was talking behind their back that the only reason why they were there because they had money and they didn't have anything else to do with themselves. And they said, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, make some pieces and go, go to some parties and that's gonna be easy. So I think there is, you learn much more from hardships and difficulties. And I'm, I think I'm one of those people who enjoys the journey probably more than the destination, arriving at the destination. So, um, and that's again come with experience. So I'm, I'm embracing the hardships because it makes me stronger. It makes me, I have more to give to the work also. Um, but having said that, I think there's a lot of misconception about um, you need money to have a jewelry business. You know, it's not just investing in materials, which of course you can choose. Not everyone has to work with gold or pearls or diamonds. There's silver, there's all sorts of, and we see that in New York Jewelry Week, Munich Jewelry Week, Athens Jewelry Week. There is a lot of artistic creativity that is um, where the focus is definitely not the materials. And you can buy very beautiful, very interesting pieces of jewelry for, I don't know, starting from a hundred pounds or dollars or euros. Um, but um, having a business in jewelry usually involves making pieces, gifting people pieces, hiring PR agency, getting pieces on celebrities, which can cost a lot of money, having a showroom in Paris and London and New York, traveling, doing trunk shows. Um, what else? I mean, there's, it's like the tip of the iceberg, what you see, and underneath there's a whole world. And I think that's probably in other businesses too, I guess, fashion or other, I mean, I don't know, maybe in the painting, no one gifts painting to people, paintings, but um, there is a lot going on from just having a structure of a website that works, uh, great photographs, great lookbooks, you know, having all your prices aligned in different countries, different currencies. There's a, a huge um structure that also needs to evolve especially now with the last year i mean we for me i only work with one person holly in london and she's you know my right and left hand um you need someone and if you are very creative you probably need someone to balance that sort of creativity um of let's say 10 20 percent with an 80 percent of having the business and that is without having an investor or you know a structure where you you need to sell to feed that structure if you have multiple people working under you so um to anyone who wants to go in it's absolutely amazing it's fantastic but it's a long-term work business life passion that keeps has to keep on evolving and keeps on giving because it's amazing and I think the probably the most important thing is to stay versatile really and to adapt and to you know keep your eyes and your ears open to what's going on around you but when you I get the whole giving pieces to celebrities and you know exposure and all of that but I think sometimes people think that's the main thing. And for me, it still is like we've discussed many times about design. So my angle is if I produce an interesting enough body of work, then people are gonna look at what I do. It's not because X person is wearing my piece of jewelry. It just doesn't reflect me. So I think automatically I shouldn't have that really, um, this connection to that kind of world so much. And so I think I like the idea of struggle because I have this conversation with a lot of people about of course how we, we need struggle like we need yeah. struggle to I mean I think there needs to be tension in the work you know absolutely um, and like say pearls for example are so beautiful that like if we don't give them some edge which is what I like about your work there is an edge to the pearl it's mm -hmm. modern it's a little bit you know there's it's not pretty frou frou um if we don't give that edge it's just another piece of pearl jewelry yeah and 
you know, I can't think of many people, I mean, there are people working with pearls who make them really interesting, but there aren't as many as there could be. Yeah. Um, and, and so- the reason is why? Yeah. Why are they getting much less interest than other gemstones? Pearls? Yes. I think they're considered a little bit dusty sometimes as a, as, as a, as a gemstone. Hmm. Because traditionally they have been the helmet hair, you know, the, you know, they've been historically the safe, the safe jewel, you know, if you were a very um, well to do um, older lady who had money, you displayed that with your pearls hmm. and, you know, we're funking them up now, but that's relatively new. They have always been that byword for respectability. Hmm. I think it's it has to do with um, the color and the shape, to be honest, also. I think it maybe just boils down to that, that they're round and they're white. And yeah. no one's really quite sure about how much they cost. Somehow it's, there is a vagueness about how much a pearl necklace would cost, but somehow diamonds, they always appear to be more expensive. I don't know, because they're, they sparkle more, they attract more attention. I think pearls are mysterious, I have to say. Because they're opaque, and I think we always struggle a bit with opaque stones. You know, I had this conversation with a friend of mine <clears throat> who's a designer who loves opaque stones, and I love them, but it's harder to fathom what they are, who they are. And I think that's something that we, on a very basic level, slightly or a bit like not mistrustful, but we, we, we don't necessarily plunge in where we see, yeah. see through a stone, we can understand it really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this takes us to freedom. What is freedom, Melanie, to you? For me, it's the ability to create my own context mm -hmm. freely. I mean, now it's obviously there is an element, a financial element to that, which comes from the collaboration with Tasaki. So I think as a jeweler, you probably get investment from family or outside investment, or you design for other companies. And I know a lot of jewelers who do that, who do that but they're not in liberty to say it. In my case, I'm very lucky because Tasaki offered me the possibility to create a brand with my name on, although it's just the initials. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, well, um, yeah. still and in, more, more particularly, I, the pieces I designed for Tasaki, I could happily design for my own brand. I could probably struggle a lot finding people to make them to such an incredibly perfect um, uh, degree, but it feels very close to what I do. So it's almost like now it's become the pearl side of my work and I am able to do more one-off pieces or work more with mother of pearl for my own brand. So it's sort of two different sides of a jewelry um, life and they actually feed into each other very, very happily. I mean, it's financial of course, because it means I have a steady income every year and I can of course live from it and choose to spend some of it to create my own pieces without thinking straight away it has to sell I have to do this and this and this every year. And at the same time, just working with a big company and just getting the experience from working with a different culture. And I mean, all the different aspects of working with Tasaki are feeding into my own work and how I evolve as a designer. It's almost a different, the two different spectrums of the, of the jewelry business, like the individual designer, the self-independent uh, designer, and the big company with a thousand employees and I don't know how many stores and distribution channels, you know, you have a marketing team that's over 10 people. It's not, and I'm just one person trying to juggle everything at the same time, but that there's a tension there actually. And it, it's wonderful because, um, I think the work I make for myself today wouldn't exist if I didn't do the work for Tasaki or if Tasaki wasn't there, it would have been something else, who knows. So I think the problem with the struggle though, is that, so you have a struggle when you create 
because you want it to be the best piece that you can. But at the same time, you need to allow your mind to be free enough to say, okay, I'm gonna buy 10 South Seas pearls, I'm gonna chop them. And it's almost like you, you need to be objective and subjective at the same time. So you need to think, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what the piece needs to come out. And then you need to step outside yourself look at it and think okay how is someone else gonna look at this and it's it's weird so i think the the struggle is great but sometimes i think it feels a bit overwhelming i mean in in our case a lot of times i've thought of what you've told me you know make it bigger make it the best that you can and i have you in my mind sometimes when i'm making pieces and i have to say no stop it's it's not what she wants it's what you want and i think it's hard when you meet either people who buy your jewelry or people who are, you know, collectors or people who influence you in one way or another to listen to them, but to also not listen to them. So I don't know, because I think you are very influential in that sense. You give your opinion and you back it up and, you know, you don't really say, oh, maybe this, maybe that. You're like, no, do that. <laughs> and I don't know how aware you are of, you know, your influence in a way or your potential influence on. No, you see, I just, I'm kind of like, you know, it's tough because as well, when you when you see collections and you're not like, maybe you don't like them. Yeah. There's that moment where something in my mind says, "Keep your mouth shut now. This is someone's life work." But then I can't. It's already out. You know. <laughs> well, my face does a thing it's not supposed to do, like that. Yeah. So. It's quite hard, you know, and we're in an industry where 95% of people say, that's nice. Yeah, and sounds... so if you're not that, it's quite hard, you know, and I I'm tr I try and not be too harsh, you know, yeah. and I try and be kind with it, but often people ask you for your opinion, but they don't want it. And yeah. then you say, do you really want to know? And they say, yeah, and then they don't. So I think, um, and it also, you know, as a creator, as a writer, yeah. um, you know, it's hard. You know, if someone doesn't like something, even if you don't care, um, it's like taking a bullet. So you have to really um, definitely give any feedback with care and be, be kind of um, positive. Even if there's something that you're not sure about, you can say, but there's always this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, you can't just go in there. And I, I, I think, I, I sometimes think when you're, writing about other people's work you have a responsibility to to care you know what happens after you drop that bomb um if it's not something you you love mm -hmm. uh, but having said that i can see the beauty in most things i can just see more beauty in some than others really mm -hmm. um and so freedom i think comes down to that you know mm -hmm. having a, having a voice of any kind yeah do you, I mean, it's a bit random, um, but do you, do you ever think, hear or feel that um, some people may attract more attention when they use diamonds or when they um, start pricing above a certain amount? I mean, I was literally told maybe last year that you need to sell, you need to have pieces above 20K. Mm. Otherwise, X, X, X is not even going to look at your work. And I thought that was interesting, but I guess it was maybe from an investing, an investor's point of view, but then I'm not sure how using diamonds or not using diamonds really has anything to do with it. So we still have the, the dual personality of, of, of a jewel, which is the yeah. art and then the commodity. And the commodity is always going to be there. It's louder in some ways than others, and louder in some people's work than others. Um, and, you know, the, the value of what you create in the market is always going to be a consideration for somebody who's going to buy it. You know, mm. some people are going to buy to resell. Some people are going to buy to never sell. Mm. Some people um, are only going to buy if they consider it to be valuable in some way. And often mm. that is material value. Um, mm. So I think the reality is, um, you know, the market is brutal. And most people who are buying above 20,000 want to feel somewhere in the back of their minds that they have invested mm. in something with mm. some kind of material value mm. to it. Um, 
unless they're very, very wealthy or unless they have so much jewellery, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and so it's rare that somebody can create a piece of jewellery which is made out of twigs. You know, there's, there, are twig jewel, there's, there are twig jewellers out there, but there's always some diamonds. You always have to have the reinforcement that this is a jewel. So um, in, unless it's um, a very famous fine artist who has decided to make a necklace of twigs, um, it's rare that somebody who is simply a, a jewellery artist can make a twig necklace without putting some uh, obviously precious material in there. And I, I'm seeing a lot, and I'm sure we, we all have, of that combination of precious and non-precious materials. It's definitely become quite a thing, you know, mm -hmm. in the last 10 years. You know, yeah. you've got a stone, you've got a pebble, you've got a diamond in it, you've got a twig, you've got a ruby in it, you know. You've yeah. got, um, you know, a bit of fluff. You've got a sapphire in it. And that's, we can't, it, it, we're, we're teetering towards fine art doing that, in, in my view. Yeah, but then about pricing. So you obviously have the cost of the materials, the amount of work, all of that, you know, your uh, electricity, all of that. And then at some point after maybe 20 years or 30 years in jewelry existence, you think, no, I'm actually going to start charging what I think this should be, you know, and it ends up like it's more, it becomes more art pricing because obviously if you take a painting, if you just take the materials, it, it's going to be very little, but then you attach it to, I don't know, let's say Jeff Koons and then it just skyrockets. So how, I mean, I don't see that many companies doing this sort of pricing where they actually multiply X amount of times, but how do you even calculate that? Or is it yeah. what someone is ready to pay for it? And then how yeah. do you figure that out anyway? You're talking about the base of value. And yeah. there, are, there are several schools of thought, like Evelyn Markaski, who I know is on this call, said to me for my book, um, I'll calculate the price by how much it is gonna take for me to make this again like mm. mentally and physically mm. that's one school yeah. another school is when you get to a point of freedom in design mm. you do whatever you like you can it can cost 20 pounds it can cost 20 million you know you've got collectors lining up who have pre-ordered things that don't exist and then you make it and then you just come up with a figure and that does happen for some designers i know designers who do that but it takes a lot to get to that position. And often all of the pieces are very heavy gem set pieces, which have a lot of intrinsic value. Yeah. Um, and for most people, they take how much they're paying for the materials, their time, you know, if they're selling to a gallery, what that, you know, they take all these things into consideration and then mm. they just, they lump like another 50% on the top or something. That's what most people do, because it's yeah. a sensible way. But um, I do think, you, you have a sense when you see a piece of jewelry which you feel is too expensive for what it is that's usually because the person who made it isn't in a position for you to think that's worth it it's not anything to do with the actual piece itself mm -hmm. it's you're like, would i pay that for that person's work and that is why it's so important to have artistic freedom because you can only get to a place where you'll pay whatever they ask when they are wild and free as creatives yeah but at that level where you have your collectors yeah. lined up, yeah. um, which I'm very, very far from, you don't just slap on a piece, I mean, uh, a price. Still, you, you think about that price. Well, it has you no relation to the material. Year I sold, I don't know, 500,000, and this year I'm just gonna double it, put a million price tag on and see what happens. There's a lot of people who wanna sell over a million, and they do, and the piece itself is worth £12.50, but they've decided they're going to sell at this point. You know, it's yeah. not as scientific as people think. There's no, a lot of people ask me, you know, where is this, this, this index of, of true, obviously there's an index of value for diamonds, but like, mm. ultimately we're making shit up because that's kind of what we do. And I love that about jewellery. It looks really official, but a lot of people are just making up a lot of things. Do you think that's part of the appeal to some people if something is so incredibly expensive that they want to have it so that, you know, they can say to their friends in that same uh, range of, you know, price that, oh, I have that or I got it. you didn't get it, I got it. 
it's the basis of all luxury. It has to hurt. So, you know, Cartier will have a dinner. They have private dinners for people. Um, and, you know, if somebody usually spends 100,000, they'll invite them and they'll put something on the table, which is 200,000. That person has to feel the pain. If there's no pain, then it, how can it be, you know, if you can just have it, it doesn't mean anything. So I'm not saying it has to be so expensive you can't, you know, you have to sell your house, but you have to go, oh, you have to look at your credit card and go, mm. and that, that biting point is the hard thing to arrive at. For your work, for you, what is that point for you? And that's where, you know, a lot of time and, and experience come in to find that for each person. Yeah, I've also been thinking about what happens if you don't sell, which of course you make something, you don't expect to sell it straight away anyway, because mm. you don't have the line of collectors. Uh, so, you know, do you say, okay, well, I'll give it a year, then I'm gonna melt it down, or I'm gonna give it three years or five years, because personally, I think for any piece of jewelry that's out there, there is someone who's gonna want it at some point. But is the secret maybe to keep the business long enough to find those people? So yeah. at any level, if you start charging a lot of money and you just have a piece sitting, you know, as a, as a designer, it hurts because it's not, a, it's not always about making the money, but it's just about finding a person who loves that piece and who wants it. You know, you want to get rid of it physically so that you make space for other work, you know, because it's out of your system. So it's been all your suffering and your struggle and your energy has gone into this piece and you just don't want to have it around anymore you really want it to find its home and then when it finds it home it, it's home it leaves space for other work so it allows you to renew yourself and to move on and to to grow yeah, i don't think you should melt it down i think part no. of it is yeah. is just waiting you know i i i know designers who have still got pieces after 20 25 years they're waiting for that moment where a marriage occurs between the piece and a collector mm. and it can take a lifetime, but the right person is out there. And it's the beauty of social media and Instagram is that you've got much more chance of finding them because if they like who you are, they're like, they're watching you right now. And I think, right. I think that has changed everything since Instagram started, you know, mm. what, what jewelry has become is totally transformed. Yeah. But I think ultimately, I think whoever manages, even if I don't like their jewelry, whoever manages to stay in this business 10, 20, 30 years, even mm -hmm. longer, is, is a hero. Because if you make jewelry that perhaps you don't sell straight away, and then you still manage to live from it, and then maybe 30 years later or 20 years later, you still have pieces from 10 years ago, you are a hero financially for you know carrying on even though you didn't sell those pieces so you kept them somewhere and you found a way to sort of survive so i guess that's where the struggle comes it's in really crucial. we have to feel it you know when i buy something i have to feel the agony of creation just like the person who made it has to feel it to make something yeah. which is a purely beautiful thing so we have to all have the struggle yeah. and if we don't you know we're not really, it's not really authentic. And that brings me to a very, con or a question which I have to nip in there because it's quite tricky. And I thought I'd ask it before we get to a point where Bella tells us off because we're talking too much. Um, is jewelry fair and is bad jewelry necessary? I think it's not fair. And I think bad jewelry is necessary. Because maybe with the pain and the struggle that you describe when you buy a piece or you want to feel, which sounds like a very painful experience, <laughs> and then you experience the hurt of the credit card. So there's a lot of pain involved. Uh, it's, you, need the, you get the total opposite. You get the pleasure. So when you have shit jewelry, then it makes you appreciate all the good jewelry. Simple as that. But it's not okay. fair. I mean, we've talked about this. It's not fair when someone comes in you know, does the sprint in front of you because they have more money, they have more connections, you know, they wear beautiful dresses, I don't know, they're in all the magazines and you're just standing there 
and you're like, I can't compete with that. It's not that you competed and you lost. It's simply that you can't compete. But then again, that hardship and that bad experience makes you find other ways to compete and potentially last longer. So even though I don't like to see shit jewelry, I feel that it's uh, necessary to, to a certain extent. But I feel a bit, it makes me a bit sad when someone comes and it's usually very short term. And I think most people within the business will identify a short term approach quite easily. And then it stops um, smaller people who don't have the means or the connections and it just basically eradicates them. I think that's a bit sad actually. Yeah, I think jewelry could be a little bit more democratic. Um, it's still run in a kind of feudal system of knowing people and being in with a certain crowd. And, and, and that can be disheartening sometimes, you know, yeah. if you come like we did, you know, you just, you got in yourself, you didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you're authentic and you have a voice and you take the time to craft some kind of, you know, unique sensibility, I think people find you. I think, I think in an industry, there's a lot of people doing a lot of quite average design. Yeah. And if you can manage to be unique, people will always find you, you know. I think so, especially with Instagram now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, but it is in that cool. sense, sorry, go ahead. No, go on. No, we're just saying in that sense, lockdown has helped. I yeah. think for, even though we're probably bombarded by, you know, millions of photos every day, actually the one that catches your eye stays with you. So I think, again, that's helped. In a sea of average jewelry or average whatever, the best photo or the, more, the most interesting piece of jewelry will actually suddenly pop out, pop up in your feed or in your mind. So again, it, it works. And that brings me to a, a, another tricky question. The two things I think are very interesting about you, which have always occurred to me. Mm -hmm. um, one is the secrecy, mm. within sort of especially high jewelry. And the yeah. second one is the copying. Yeah. Uh, without credit. Yeah. So obviously we know people are going to be copied because it's the highest form of flattery and there's no original design at this point, 40,000 years in. True. But we do see quite a lot of people, you get to a certain level and then suddenly people are bringing things out that look kind of identical, but not saying I've been inspired by. So I'm not averse to copying at all. But I think people should say like this, this, you know, this person, that person, that art movement, this, you know, has, has been part of my process. Mm. Do you get annoyed about copying? Do you feel it affects you at all? How do you feel about people sort of like taking your design as some kind of inspiration? Um, there was an incident a few weeks ago where I saw a piece uh, from Hermes that was a silver rectangle necklace newly launched that was very close to a piece I made for Tasaki that's pretty much 10 years old. And someone sent it to me, actually, it was interesting if you notice something yourself and you think someone's copied you or if someone not sees it and sends it to you because it's a different a difference of perception. Yeah. And I thought, mm, okay, so of course, you know, Tasaki is a massive brand. I forwarded it to them and they can deal with it. They've got the lawyers, all of that. So, but personally, I don't care. It just feels very short term. I mean, okay, if someone maybe starts, let's say, I don't know, slicing pearls and selling millions and millions of them and making millions and millions of money, I might get annoyed because I'm like, well, I got the idea, you make millions and then you're probably gonna go and copy someone else. But I just, it doesn't touch me because first of all, it's not personal. And second of all, it's short term again, like it comes and goes. And maybe I, I think maybe there's a way now to actually post that and get the eyes of the industry on it and say, I found these two, what do you think? And leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And just make a, not a statement, but put it out there and just let it pass. It doesn't touch me as much as it did before, I think. I'm much more relaxed about these things now. I'm not inviting anyone, by the way, to <laughs> not copy <laughs> anyone, yeah, not just me, <laughs> but anyone. But I think ultimately, um, 
the people who want to buy, I'm assuming the cheaper copy, that's what they want. The people who want to buy the original, they probably looked for the original, they're aware of the original, probably the original is more money, and that's the money that they want to spend. So it's not by calling out the copy that you're necessarily going to get those people who wanted to buy it. Yeah, I don't understand copying because as a collector, you want the original. You know, you want the yeah. holy grail. You don't want like the knockoff. Yeah. You know, like, you know, you don't want to get the the sort of the market bag on your holiday. You want the real thing. You know, the, the pleasure of a collector is to save up inch by inch, year after year, and to walk mm -hmm. into that place after 10 years and buy it. You know, that is is 80% of it. So Yeah, but you the, need to be aware of the original. Well, awareness is the thing because actually a lot of people buy knockoffs of, of all kinds of luxury. They have no concept because they have no interest in finding out. All you have to do is look it up. So I think there's a lot of people who just want to buy an accessory and we're talking about art and it's two very different types of sort of collectors, I think, you know. If you want yeah. something pretty that looks nice, you know, you buy whatever you think looks nice. Right. And if you want to invest your time and knowledge and energy into a, a designer, then you'll do your homework. And, and but isn't it an homage also? I'm not talking about myself, but I'm seeing this from maybe a more arty point of view where of course you can't buy the Picasso, but you buy the postcard or the poster and you have it in your room and you absolutely love it. See, see I would say save up and buy the sketch. Still, yeah. So, you know, it depends kind of what you're aiming for. Again, my whole motto in life is go big or go home. Basically. Yeah, yeah, you've made that very clear. I've made that point several times. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And so yeah. I've run out of questions. Yes, I, I'm going to jump in here before we have to go home. I'm going to jump in here and because we have a lot of really great questions from the audience. So I just want to make sure we get to them. And everybody probably hates me for stopping you two because this has been incredible. I want um, to have one last question. At the end of the day, okay. the last one. Yeah. You're going to have to cut us no. off. No, no. Right <laughs> I, I think, to be honest, everyone seems so engaged. I think they will be totally comfortable with, with staying on to hear the last question. Um, so this is a question for uh this is a question for melanie grant mm -hmm. um does a piece from a designer that you don't normally seek ever speak to you so much that you overlook who it is from and bide for its appearance or the way that it speaks to you yes and i have to say um so i'm wearing a ring at the moment by a designer called rachel quinn mm -hmm. uh, which is pearls and sort of uh, it's a big heart I didn't know who she was at all. She, she's she's um, in California and um, I was just traipsing through Instagram one day and thought, oh, you know, like I just need to, I need something. Mm -hmm. And so often the visual stops you in your tracks and then you have to go and find out. So then I had to go and find everything about her. I had to phone her up and talk to her and figure out who she was. And I thought I need to be part of that universe. So absolutely you can buy on site, but then me being someone like me, I have to then find everything else out that they've ever done to figure out if that's somebody I want to be, you know, with. But mostly, it, occasionally it will be something you think, oh, and then you find the original version, you think, well, actually, I want the original and not that. But as we were talking about, it's up to you to do your homework. Yeah. And then another question, sort of in that same vein, um, also to Mel, are you interested in the concept behind the making of a piece? Do you document this along with the materials that it is made of? Well, that's a very interesting question because the craft of jewellery I'm less interested in mm -hmm. than what it means and, and what the meaning for me is key. Like I get into a lot of conversations about craft. Um, you know, it doesn't matter to me if someone's made it themselves or if they have a workshop. It doesn't really matter to me if they did 24 bobbles of gold or 22 bobbles of gold. What matters to me is when I see it, does it change for me design? Does it change my perception of who they are, of art? Does it change my life? Mm. That's what matters to me much more than how they soldered that bit onto that bit. But for some people, that's really important. For me, it's less so. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. 
Um, okay, just sort of looking through the questions. This one is for Melanie Georgiakopoulos. Um, uh, one of my dearest friends, also a, a sincere jewelry lover, uses her home to wear some of her jewelry. For example, some necklaces on plants. Is it important for you to have a human wear your work? Uh, uh, <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> It is, um, in, um, I, yeah, I would ask in what sense, like every day? I mean, have my pieces worn by someone in the house or just generally for someone to eventually wear them at some point? I don't know if I can, I can ask a more specific um, question to that. But no, I mean, for me uh, personally, I choose to wear jewelry on certain occasions. I don't feel I need to wear jewelry every day. Um, probably because my mother really never wore that much jewelry every day, but I, I have such a strong passion for jewelry and I need to have jewelry in space in a box, not necessarily looking at it, but I need to be close to jewelry. So no jewelry on plants though, sorry. <laughs> but I, I totally get that. I'd have a jewelry on a plant and you know, I probably got jewelry on plants somewhere around here, but yeah. <laughs> You just want to look at it like a sculpture. I yeah. think that's what they're saying. Yeah. Exactly. I think the idea is that does it have to be worn or can it be installed somewhere in the home for you to appreciate it? Yeah, I think it should be installed somewhere in the home also. It's just for me, in my case, I can't have too many things lying around because I've got two little boys and they're going to destroy it or, you know, do things with it. But I think there is a place for jewelry that just stands in its own right, for sure. Um, so next question, um, who, and this is for both of you, who in the jewelry world do you admire for their boldness? That's a hard question, but it's a good one. I mean, they're all really good, but that's. That's a hard one, because that's like, you know, it's tricky to sometimes talk about people in the industry because yeah. I get phone calls from people saying, why didn't you mention me? Mm. And I get phone calls from people saying, you know, what about this person? Um, and there is quite a lot of, um, you know, it can, it can be difficult talking about people. I mean, and what is boldness exactly? What does that yeah. mean? Mm. Yeah, because boldness can be, um, it, that it's not necessarily the bigger, the better. It's also about the mind frame or how they used a certain material in a certain way. I mean, for me, Hemerle is, you know, way up there, but in terms of boldness, I've seen David Bielander works with gold and he transforms it. It makes it look like cardboard. Uh, Lin Chung makes rock crystal big brooches where you can see the cracks on. Uh, Carolyn Broadhead makes, um, I don't know, pieces, yeah, bold in the sense that they just make you stop mm. and think, oh, wow, I've never seen that before. So it's, it's not necessarily about the size or how much gold or how big is the stone. Maybe voice, maybe that is a good way of thinking about boldness. Someone yeah, who also, has there are really some people who place. they do something and they change how everyone else does something. You know, like mm. I've always thought, say for example, that Wallace Chan you know, there's now like a whole generation of Wallace Chans um, who look a bit like him, but aren't him. Mm -hmm. So I think some people do a thing, even if no one else likes it, and mm -hmm. they inspire this whole generation of other people who then take that and make it into something slightly different. Yeah. Um, I really like Daniel Brush. I think he's um, really interesting because he refuses to sit in any kind of category. He just makes things you can hold, things you can wear, things you can kind of sit on, you know, it's just, um, he just makes what he makes and you just do what you want with it, you know? And I quite like, I quite like that. And his things are completely different. So he doesn't even have like one style. And I think if, if I had any um, hope for jewelry is that we can, we can be anything. Mm. We don't have to, it doesn't have to be a butterfly on, on a brooch, it can be, just an object that we decide to hang, wear, look at, mm. but it's still a piece of art, which we then migrate to different environments. We, we do definitely suffer from 
um, you know, sometimes genericness when it comes to design really kind of gets all lumped together, you know, uh, in that. So I, I like people who are free, who just do whatever they like. I like wild people. Mm -hmm. that's, that's wonderful. I love that. Um, so we have more questions, but uh, Melanie, you said you had a question and we're at the hour. We're actually a little past and I know everybody is so engaged, but I also want to make sure that you, <laughs> that you oh, get it. No, I, mean, uh, I wanted to ask Mel, Mel if she ever bought a piece online just by seeing it online, but you kind of answered that before because you said you found this piece online and yes. you contacted the maker. Yes. Yes. I have. It's not my first choice. I prefer to go into a studio, sit down, hold someone's face, sing to them, and then figure out what they think I should have. But then some, I have definitely bought things online. I buy things online all the time, mm -hmm. um, but definitely over a certain price point, I want to get a bit more, you know, intimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do, and can I squeeze it? A small one, just a small yeah. one. <laughs> Do you think that the way to attract collectors, the ultimate collectors, is to do um, shows like Tefaf and Masterpiece and Pad? Or do you think that if you have an individual voice, people will find you one way or the other? It's a combination. So the reality is, at the top level, um, designers are in the art space as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives you access to um, a, a different stratosphere of collector who is cross collecting art and jewelry and cars and wine and everything. It's also important to also be at top level auctions mm. as well. That reaches a completely different um, stratosphere of, of global collector. Mm. And the hardest thing for small independents is just to just people to know who you are, you know, yeah, in the same breath as, you know, somebody very well known so yeah. i would say definitely get into an art space you know you don't have to have a stand at tfaf because it costs a fortune you mm -hmm. can um do something you know in that week round the corner and invite people because the whole world is there at that one time so it's, mm -hmm. you can do a lot of this happens in the watch world where there'll be a big watch fair and then everyone has a little thing around the corner you know where and then you can nip over and that works quite well for watches so definitely consider the art space. Yeah. It's important. Okay. I'm done with questions. Um, so thank you so much. This has been incredible. We do, there are more questions from the audience, but in the interest of time, we will direct you to both of the Melanie's Instagram page and your more than welcome to reach out and direct message them. Um, so I just want to thank you all so very much for being here today. Um, please visit our website, www.nycjewelryweek.com, as well as our Instagram page to learn more about us and our ongoing initiatives to support the industry. And hang tight, there are more jewelry confidants scheduled for April. So we will be sending out some dates soon. Please join our mailing list so you can and we, uh, get our mailers um, because you will not want to miss those. And in case you do miss any of our, if you missed our past conversations, or if you want to recommend this one to your friends, please visit our YouTube page. Um, we will put the Instagram handles for both Melanie's in our chat. So please direct them. Melanie, Mel, thank you both so very much. This has been incredible. Um, as always, I bow down to both of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we will continue this conversation um, offline, I'm sure, and we invite everyone to do so as well. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day wherever you are today. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so oh much. God, Bye. Bye. Bye.